we might not be directly funding the war in Ukraine. We might not be directly paying the soldiers' salaries or sending in the tanks and so on. But the whole system that has created this, you know, aggressive dictatorship is underpinned by the offshore services of the City of London. The City of London is very good at moving money around, doing it secretly, efficiently, cleverly. Oligarchs are very good at killing people, stealing companies, uh, rigging court cases, invading sovereign nations. And it's so distressing that it wasn't enough that, you know, Russia was being looted. It wasn't enough that they invaded Georgia. It wasn't enough that they annexed Crimea. It wasn't enough that they poisoned Alexander Litvinenko and Sergei Skripal. You know, it finally takes this to make the government sit up and say, oh, maybe we shouldn't have taken that money in in the first place. Oliver Biller, hello, how are you doing? I'm all right, all right. Stressful times, but yeah, there we go. <laughs> and you've got a new book out, which some might argue is scarily well-timed. Butler to the world, how Britain became the servant of tycoons, tax dodgers, kleptocrats and criminals. It's out in March. Did you time the publication date? Yeah, I, I, um, my wife was accusing me of having, you know, offered Putin a deal to, uh, <laughs> but but to be honest, the, the kind of weird thing about this is about three months ago, um, someone was saying, you've got to get this book out, you've got to get this book out, it's so timely. And about six months ago, I, I was talking to someone who said, well, it's so timely, why don't you get it out right now? It, it seems to be always relevant. There is always somewhere in the world, often in Russia, but not always, evidence of how Putin, how, sorry, evidence of how Britain has essentially enabled mafiosi, crooks, kleptocrats to do really bad things. And I suppose it is a little bit heartening that finally, um, someone that we have enabled has finally done something so beyond the pale that the government is saying, all right, maybe we'll do something about it. But, you know, we've heard these promises before, so I'm not taking them to the bank just yet. Yeah. Um, and so, like you say, it just all came to a really horrific head. Obviously, no one wanted this to be the the, in, the incident that shone such a such a light on, on the issue. Um, so and obviously, there's been a real concentration on the relationship between Russian money and the UK kind of since last week. Um, could you just give a rundown on what that looks like, what the relationship between uh, Britain and Russian money looks like? Um. Britain has particular skills, um, particularly the City of London has particular skills, and Russian oligarchs have particular skills, and those skills are very different. The City of London is very good at moving money around, doing it secretly, efficiently, cleverly. Oligarchs are very good at killing people, stealing companies, uh, rigging court cases, invading sovereign nations. You know, those two skills are very different, but complementary. And after 1991, um, both sides realised that there was a lot of money to be made if they essentially teamed up um, and operated as two halves of an operation. Um, we often talk about corruption as something that happens in poor countries, you know, developing countries, Eastern European countries. Um, but really, that's only half of the story. You can't be, you can't take a bribe if you don't have someone paying a bribe. You know, you can't steal money if you don't have someone to launder the money. You know, if you're stealing something, you need a fence to, to, to move your stolen goods so you can monetize them. Britain has, for all that period, played the role of the other half of the trade for the Russian oligarchs. And finally, um, there's been this very long overdue realization that that is an incredibly harmful thing to have done. It's been very profitable for certain people in this country. Um, it's been extraordinarily profitable for a small group of people in Russia, but for everyone else, it's been really bad. And what we're seeing at the moment in Ukraine is sadly an incredibly dramatic demonstration of that. And then kind of the realization that this, as you say, is really bad, kind of <laughs> cuts right to the part to the heart of it. Um, the UK has now placed placed sanctions on Russians and Russian oligarchs. Uh, will will these sanctions actually have the desired impact? Um I mean, the sanctions as part of a Western package are having an impact. I mean, you can't look at the Russian markets today because they're closed, which is an impact, um, you know, but but more broadly, it, in a way, we already had good laws, you know, not perfect, but we already had good laws against money laundering and kleptocracy and grand corruption and financial crime and fraud. We, we had laws against those things. Um, the reason why oligarchs have been able to come here and operate here and feel at home here is because we didn't enforce those laws. And nothing that's happened so far from the UK government 
convinces me that they've understood that, that the problem is not one of laws. You can't just outlaw Putin, right? You can't just pass a law in Westminster and, well, hey, Putin's just going to throw his hands up and say, I'm done. You know, this is a question that requires us to take prosecuting the crimes of these people as seriously as they take committing them. And that means we need to invest in our law enforcement agencies, in the National Crime Agency, in the Serious Fraud Office. And we still haven't done that. You know, Boris Johnson has announced the creation of a kleptocracy unit. We already had an international corruption unit. Mm -hmm. You know, is this, are they just changing the sign on the door and thinking that's going to make Putin, you know, run away? It, It doesn't work like that. You need to properly resource this. And it takes years to, it will take years to root out all this money in our country if we can ever do it. But the most important thing is to, from this moment, make sure no, no more comes. Once, once we sure, ensure no more money comes here, we can start looking into what came in the past. And, and that, I don't think the government has realised. I don't think they're taking that sufficiently seriously. You wrote in the Sunday Mirror this weekend, what Miami was to Al Capone, London is to oligarchs. What, what did you mean by that? Well, you know, you know mobsters in Chicago they, as like oligarchs, they were very good at certain things, killing people, you know, stealing stuff, rigging elections, all those things. But, but they didn't have the skills required to, you know, move money around, hide money, do all the kind of clever financial engineering stuff that means that having stolen money, you need to be able to hide it in order to be able to spend it because it needs to have the connection between you and it erased. This is what Miami used to do um, in the golden days of the mob. And to be honest, they still do it, but just they do it for mafiosi from South America these days. Um, that's what London did for oligarchs. We were, you know, the mob bankers for the mob. Um, and yeah, we dressed it up in different language. We talked about, you know, economic incentivizing and, and they, people came up with these lovely justifications that, you know, we were exporting best practice to Russia. You know, as it turned out, we weren't exporting best practice to Russia. They were exporting worse practice to us. And, you know, there was a tremendous naivety and to be honest, arrogance that after the Cold War ended, that they were just desperate to learn from, you know, the wonderful ethical British about how they should do business. When actually, in reality, quite a lot of people in this country were quite happy to learn new ways of being corrupt from the frankly very resourceful Russian oligarchs. And that's what really happened. And do you think that was like, was that a naivety on the part of the British of, well, communism's over, they're looking to pursue ethical capitalism? Was, it, was there just a complete misunderstanding on what, what was afoot? It was a very profitable naivety, put it that way. <laughs> I think, I think um, you know, it is easy to convince yourself of the merits of an argument if you're making a lot of money out of it. I put it that way. I don't think people were necessarily corrupt. I don't think people need to be corrupt. You know, there isn't somewhere you know, uh, a bad guy sitting in the city of London in a swivel chair with a with a white cat, you know, laughing maniacally to himself. Instead, there's just a lot of people looking to make commissions out of trades. And if those trades aren't illegal, then, you know, someone will do them. You, mm-hmm. you know, one person might not do them because it's unethical, but if, but then someone else will do them. So the first person will just feel like a fool and next time he'll do them too. So let's, take back to kind of the Ukrainian invasion could it be said that Britain has funded this invasion by harboring all this illicit Russian money um you know not directly funded but if you look at the structure of the Russian system um not you know the Russian economy and, and politics which all have these sort of superstructure of which look, makes it look like a normal country but the reality of it The reality of the Russian economy is there is a very small group, 500 people perhaps, around Vladimir Putin who have become incredibly wealthy and very powerful during his time in office. They own more wealth than essentially everyone else in Russia put together, Um, just 500 people in a nation of 145 million. Um, And all of those people don't trust each other any more than we trust them. So they like to keep a goodly share of their wealth outside of Russia to make sure that it's safe from predation by rivals. If if they fall out of Putin's favor, then they don't want to have their money taken away. And more than half of all of Russian national wealth, more than half is held outside Russia. It's held offshore via offshore tax havens, anonymously controlled, and often ends up in London because London is a really lovely place to put your money. You know, it's 
the, your property is safe here and it's not going to be investigated here. So the Putin system, which is you know a crucial underpinning of his rule is the fact that he's kept these people happy and kept them wealthy. That whole system is underpinned by the services of the city of London and its satellite offshore territories. So we might not be directly funding the war in Ukraine. We might not be directly paying the soldiers' salaries or sending in the tanks and so on. But the whole system that has created this you know, aggressive dictatorship is underpinned by the offshore services of the city of London. And then what do you think of, what do you make of the British reaction to Russia so far? Have the sanctions been strong enough or well targeted? I mean, it, the sanctions are a good start. Um, you know, they started poorly, they've, they've picked up, but I've been disappointed that they haven't specifically targeted more of these 500 people or so around Putin. Just a few dozen of them, the really top ones, and particularly their family members, because often their wealth is held by their family members. If you want them to sit up and take notice of what you're doing, you need to cost them money. Putin has been very good at earning these people money over the last three decades. We need to make sure that he is now associated with losing them money. And we have not done enough of that. I hope that that is coming. Um, also, you know, there's been some long overdue reforms to the way British economy works, bringing transparency into offshore owned property, cleaning up our disastrous shell company register company's house, you know, which are long overdue. But I've heard nothing about resourcing for these reforms. You know, mm -hmm. we need multiples of the amount of money currently going into these agencies to pay for new people, new processes, you know, new tech systems in order to be able to to do what the government is asking of them. And that hasn't happened. And until we see the government resourcing fighting kleptocratic wealth as well as the oligarchs resource defending kleptocratic wealth, we're going to lose. Um, it, you know, it's just straightforward. So that is something that we haven't seen enough of yet. And that is something that is long overdue. So, something that kind of staggers me slightly is all these measures being taken now, but, but not, nothing, nothing about this is, is new. Like Russian oligarchs have been fixtures at private schools in London, they've owned property in London for X amount of years. Is it just an issue of funding? Is that why there hasn't been there is that why there hasn't been a targeted action, or is that why they've managed to survive? Essentially, yes. Um, the laws have been in place to target this. I mean, you know, there have been issues, but largely speaking, the laws have been in place. It, it isn't easy to do these jobs, but it's not impossible. Um Essentially, um, the National Crime Agency, the Serious Fraud Office, have been fighting with both hands tied behind their backs and their feet tied together. You know, there's this very telling quote from the Intelligence and Security Committee's report into Russian interference in the UK, which was published two years ago, when the head of the NCA asked why she didn't spend more time going after oligarchs, says, bluntly, we are concerned about the impact on our budget. And that is indicative of an agency that just isn't able to, to, to do what it needs to do. It's like going to war and only having two tanks. Obviously, you're going to lose against an army with 100. And that's just, just reality. Um, but it isn't fair to blame the National Crime Agency for that or the Serious Fraud Office. This is a political failure, a political failure that has gone on for years and decades that politicians have not taken this issue seriously. They have deliberately under-resourced these agencies. And we do need to wonder we genuinely need to wonder if this isn't a conscious choice. You know, what is called legalization by under-resourcing. If you essentially, you pass a law, but you don't enforce it, you're just getting the kudos for having passed the law without any of the downside of driving the money away. And that's, I think, is what has really been happening for a long time. And then kind of looking, looking forwards, the government is introducing the economic crime bill to the parliament. Liz Truss said that she's a hit list of oligarchs that will be targeted. What do you, do you have any faith in the in the movements going forward? These are welcome measures. You know, let's face it, the government has been promising to bring in the measures in the economic crime bill for what, five, six years now. Um, and, you know, when when parliamentary time allows um, it, it's. It's great to see that they're finally doing the right thing, but this is what it takes to make them do the right thing. You know, the kind of war in Europe that we haven't seen really for well i mean in our in my lifetime um that's what it takes and and it's so distressing that it wasn't enough 
that you know Russia was being looted. It wasn't enough that they invaded Georgia. It wasn't enough that they annexed Crimea. It wasn't enough that they poisoned Alexander Litvinenko and Sergei Skripal. You know, it finally takes this to make the government sit up and say, "Oh, maybe we shouldn't have taken that money in in the first place." You know, yes, great that they're finally doing the right thing, but I still am suspicious that when it comes down to it, and when public attention is as on the next crisis that they maybe won't get around to giving the National Crime Agency the resources they need. We need to remain vigilant and keep forcing the government to prioritise this issue as they've finally started prioritising it now. Because I suspect that, you know, given the opportunity, they'll, you know, put this one on the back burner once more. Oliver Buller, author of Butler to the World, thank you very much for your time. Thank you.